Hey guys, welcome to the Built Lean podcast. I'm Mark Perry, the creator of Built Lean, which helps busy men with demanding careers get lean, strong, and functionally fit with exceptional vitality. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Dr. David Katz. And so Dr. Katz is literally one of the top nutrition experts in the world. I'm serious when I say that. He's the founding director of Yale University's Prevention Research Center. He's also the founder of True Health Initiative and Diet ID. He has published over 200 scientific articles and textbook chapters and authored or co-authored 18 books to date. He is the recipient of several awards for his contributions to public health, and he has received three honorary doctorate degrees. If you want to learn more details, you can check out his CV, which is 66 pages long. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I came across Dr. Katz many years ago and I did a Q and A with him on Boat Lean, uh, back in 2014. And if I personally, if I have a question about nutrition, I want to find out what Dr. Katz thinks. It's just that simple. And so, um, uh, you know, there, there are so many voices out there regarding nutrition, and, and he's one of the few voices I really pay close attention to. So with all that said, thank you so much for, for joining today, Dr. Katz. Well, it's great to be with you, Mark, and I appreciate the very kind introduction. So thank you. Cool. So I guess to start off, I mean, Dr. Katz, you've been at this for, for quite a while, right? And so, you know, what sparked your interest and career focus in preventative medicine and nutrition when I imagine many of your peers were going in different directions? Well, I started out in a different direction, too. My dad's a cardiologist. <clears throat> My mm-hmm. career choices were the fairly obvious ones. Maybe I'll be a lawyer. Maybe I'll be a doctor. I wasn't terribly <laughs> creative. My dad was a doctor. I was inspired by uh, what he did and, and the devotion to saving lives. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do something like that. So chose medical school and then chose internal medicine. And I chose internal medicine because I was kind of interested in everything and, and hadn't really narrowed down my career focus. So up until that time, my residency in internal medicine, everything was was pretty conventional. Mm-hmm. And then the, the native predilections of my brain took over. And this may or may not be an aptitude. It may be an, a liability, but I'm very much drawn to the big picture. I always see patterns. Now, when you're caring for an individual patient, you know, really you need to be focused, laser focused on the care of the individual patient. And, and I was, and I appreciated the privilege of doing that. But I observed the patterns in the hospital and and the patterns of my residency. And uh, I was pretty much overwhelmed by how much terrible stuff I was learning how to treat that never needed to happen in the first place. And, you know, we were seeing people in in horrible shape after heart attacks and heart failure and strokes and cancer and AIDS. And, you know, so much of this was preventable and, and we knew how. And I thought, you know, I, it's, it's really not going to be fully satisfying to spend my entire career rushing out to try and extinguish fires that never needed to ignite. I need to be in the, in the prevention role, and I have to figure out how to do that. So after, I guess, most of the way through my training in internal medicine, I started shopping around for what comes next and landed on preventive medicine. And so I did a second residency in preventive medicine public health focusing on the prevention of chronic cardiometabolic diseases in particular. And then my, my fate was sealed uh, by a publication in 1993. So that's when I completed my training in preventive medicine, 1993. I, I imagine I graduated the master's program in public health at Yale in June. And I think it was September of that year that the paper came out in JAMA by Bill Fage and Mike McGinnis entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. And, and it's probably a rare story that a single mm-hmm. scientific publication alters the trajectory of a career, but there's no question that's what happened to me. So for those who don't know this paper, it's, it's, and, and I recommend everybody have a look at it, it's incredibly important. Basically what these two authors said was everything we're used to talking about as causes of death is wrong. Because heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, these aren't really causes at all. They're effects. And what we want to know is effects of what? What's the, what's the modifiable stuff, the environmental stuff or the behavioral stuff that we can do something about that is truly the root cause of all the heart disease and cancer and, and cerebrovascular disease and much of the infectious disease that winds up on death certificates. And when they were done with their analysis, they, they concluded that a list of 10 factors – 
explained away all of the premature deaths that occur in the United States every year, but for a rounding error. And just three factors accounted for 80%. And those three were what I have referred to ever since as bad use of feet, forks, and fingers. So feet, physical activity, forks, dietary patterns, and fingers, tobacco. Back in 1993, when this paper came out, the number one cause of premature death in the U.S. and much of the modern world was tobacco. Flash forward to now, the number one cause is diet. And so the combination of diet and lack of physical activity now explains more premature deaths than, than any other variable. Nothing even comes close. And that's partly because we smoke a lot less than we used to, partly because our diets are so terrible and our physical activity levels tend to be so bad. So really, right then and there, I said, my career, however much I might love to try to win a Nobel Prize or something, you know, and, and ask some really erudite question and, and, and pursue the answer, I can't justify that. We already have the answer. We could eliminate 80% of premature death and 80% of the burden of chronic disease in the world around us right now, 80% less heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, if we simply took what we already know and convert that knowledge into the power of routine action. And I said, that's what I have to devote my career to. Now, 30 years later, uh, I still feel that was the right decision, but it's, it, it is frustrating um, that we're, we're actually still losing the war. There's actually more, chronic, more preventable chronic disease now than when I started. So miles to go before I sleep, that's for sure. So on that topic, you said something really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of one of your books, one of your 18 books I read, which is essentially um, basically, actually, let me, let me get the exact quote. Give me, give me one second. So it's along the lines of, you know, there's businesses that exist to s sell us foods that make us ill, right? And that's one part of the cycle. And there's another part, which is there are, you know, industries that profit <laughs> from selling us drugs to uh, fix the sickness. And so there's yeah. this cycle. So is that right? Is that kind of part of the that, whole? Yeah, I, well, a absolutely. So I, I've referred to this many ways over right. the years. I, I actually have a slide cool. in some of the talks where I, I show the good guys, the public health right. guys, uh, all wearing our white hats and, and we're bailing the sinking boat with little pipettes. Meanwhile, the boat is, is being flooded with a fire hose, uh, <laughs> right. you know, and Coke and Pepsi and, and McDonald's and Duncan and, you know, all, all the usual suspects. So, yeah, I mean, frankly, we've never tried as a culture. We've never tried to fix obesity. We've never tried to fix chronic disease. We actually profit massively as a culture by propagating these. So I, I think you're referring to the truth about food, which is the book where I most develop these arguments about who profits right from the, the, the horrendous state of American health, which by the way, Mark, as we're having this conversation now in the middle of the pandemic, a huge contribution to the terrible toll of COVID in the United States is the horrible cardiometabolic health our nation brought into the pandemic to begin with. Now, one of, one of the best explanations for why mortality is so much higher in the US than many countries around the world is our bad health. Uh, it's it's a huge contributor. There are other factors too, but but that's a big one. And I've been arguing throughout the pandemic that there's never been a better time for a national health promotion campaign because it would be good for the long term, good for the vitality of the nation, and an immediate defense against the most adverse effects of the virus. So, uh, you know, we've never tried to fix this at the level of our culture. And you know, essentially, what I develop in the, in the truth about food is this notion that big food peddles glow-in-the-dark uh, frankenfoods that make people fat and sick and profits massively. And Big Pharma sells people drugs to treat these diseases they never needed to get in the first place. And I have this morbid fantasy about the CEO of Big Food and the CEO of Big Pharma in a smoky boardroom with a locked door, grinning at one another, shaking hands and saying, hey, we can laugh about this all the way to the bank. But uh, essentially, America does run on Dunkin' and Coke and Pepsi are the national hydration beverages. And we peddle multicolored marshmallows to children as part of their complete breakfast. We are being bamboozled. And uh, we're complicit in it because, frankly, a nation of loving parents and grandparents should shake themselves out of their stupor and be outraged. Be outraged that a, a, a food supply that actually is willfully engineered to be addictive and make people fat and sick is hiding in plain sight. 
And, and when I say willfully engineered, I'm invoking the writing, uh, among others, of Michael Moss, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist, author of Salt, Sugar, Fat, and Hooked, wrote a New York Times Magazine cover story a few years back entitled The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. It's another reading I, I encourage uh, everybody to check out, The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. And in brief, every major food company has teams of PhDs mm-hmm. and functional MRI machines they give them along with marching orders to design foods people can't stop eating until their arms get tired from lifting it to their mouths. And they're really, really good at it. So I, I think is a this is all really powerful. And so what is... You're, you've been a crusader for decades, and I want to dive into some of the more nitty gritty in a second. But like, what what's the solution? Like, how what is in your opinion? Like, what what do you think could make the difference and reverse this upward trajectory of obesity? Enough people need to understand that the solution is simple. It's just not easy, and believe that it matters. So it, it, it really does rely on dissemination of trustworthy information, persuasion, and then a critical mass. And then we can we absolutely can can fix all of this. The analogy I've always used for obesity, and, and it really does extend to chronic disease too that I like best, is drowning. We don't wait for people to drown and direct all our resources to resuscitating them. We have lifeguards at beaches. We post signs that say there's a riptide or the, you know, the currents are dangerous or there are sharks in the water. Stay out today. We teach people to swim. We put fences around pools. Everybody is vigilant with young children near the water. In other words, massive effort is directed at prevention. And then because stuff happens and occasionally someone drowns in spite of all of that, we, of course, have the means to resuscitate them and, and treat the victims. But massively more of the effort is focused at prevention. And then just, you know, the, the remainder, as required, is directed at treatment. Obesity and, and chronic disease should be exactly the same. So, you know, essentially, junk food is a riptide. Junk food is sharks in the water. We don't say, stay away from this food. It's bad for you. It's going to make you fat and sick. We say fortified with 11 essential vitamins and minerals, part of a complete breakfast. Everybody should buy this stuff. So that would be like, yes, there are riptides. Yes, there are dangerous currents. Yes, there are sharks. But we put up a sign at the beach that says, come on in, the water's fine. It's a lie. It's, a, it's an overt deception. So the public needs to snap out of it. We do need to recognize that we're being exploited and you know we need a critical mass of, of people in the health professions to come together to generate a signal that's audible above all the noisy nonsense in our culture. I, I founded a nonprofit organization, the True Health Initiative, for that very purpose. So what we represent is the science sense and global expert consensus about diet and lifestyle as medicine. So we're looking to grow and reach enough people and be persuasive enough that everybody understands there's fundamental good and fundamental bad about diet and food choice and lifestyle practices. And knowing the difference between the two, we should all actively oppose any entities that are trying to talk us into the bad to basically mortgage our health for the sake of their profits. And certainly we should all oppose any entity that's trying to talk us into doing that to our children. Please mortgage the future health of your children to fatten my corporate coffers. Uh, we should all be outraged anytime we encounter that. So we need, we need to awaken the sleeping giant. And the sleeping giant is us in our righteous multitudes. So what do the fundamental goods look like? Can you talk about that? They, they look like stuff that actually grows in nature. They look like stuff that comes from a plant rather than a factory type plant. They look like stuff that our great-grandparents would also have recognized as food. So they look like vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, water when you're thirsty. And sure, they can look like meat and dairy and eggs and fish and seafood too, albeit in smaller quantities, but real food. They don't look like something that comes in a box with an ingredient list that runs off the package. They don't look like Uh, food that if you turned out the light, you suspect might very well glow in the dark. Uh, You know, they don't look like 
something where the order of the ingredients is not even consistent with the kind of food it's supposed to be. So, for example, kids' cereal, the very word cereal means it's a grain. That's what cereal means. It's a cereal grain. And yet, very often, the first ingredient, which means the single most abundant ingredient, is some kind of sugar. Well, then that's not cereal with sugar. That's sugar that's with cereal. Sugar, <laughs> sugar with, you know, right. essence of grain added to right. it, right? So call it sugar with et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's a misnomer. It's an utter deception. It's outrageous. So it doesn't look like that. So, you know, again, the, I, I, that, that's part of the, the, the power of this is the fundamental simplicity of the right remedy. Michael Pollan expressed it in those famous seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, many others have expressed it in related terms. I think I got it down to five with wholesome foods and sensible combinations. But, you know, basically, if you develop the argument, it's make your diet up mostly of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, plain water for thirst. Focus on that. Do a lot of that and less of everything else. And then we actually have new ways of judging the quality of food. There's the fairly recently developed NOVA classification system for essentially for junk food. It, it, it is, in scientific jargon, it's a scale for the degree of processing and, and essentially designed to identify ultra-processed food. So it was developed by Carlos Montero and colleagues. Uh, Carlos is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And it's now been used widely in research, including by Kevin Hall at the NIH, where he did a randomized trial and showed that just ultra-processing, keep the foods the same, but simply change the degree of processing, it alters the appetite signals and people overeat ultra-processed food. So people assigned to the ultra-processed food diet ate 500 extra calories a day and gained weight. So we, we know that this drives overeating, overbuying which is good for the companies doing the selling, but it also drives obesity, chronic disease, bad for those of us doing the eating. So, you know, the less processing, the better. The shorter the ingredient list, the better. Uh, and the more foods you can eat that have an ingredient list of just one word. <laughs> right, right. 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 Walnuts, walnuts. <laughs> avocado, avocado. Ingredients right. in, you know, spinach, spinach. So, you know, the more of that, the better. Okay, and so, and so, what I'm, I'm kind of curious, what is your own diet look like? Can you give me an example of, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe? My breakfast is, is very uh, standard. It's mixed berries, expensive, um, but I indulge in them. Um, and usually one or more whole grain cereals, hot or cold, depending on the time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes nuts, almonds or walnuts. Uh, usually I don't have any kind of milk, but sometimes a little bit of almond milk in there. And, um, I typically add some cinnamon and then I add fruits in season. So, you know, I love to add in, um, summer fruits, peaches and such. Um, the winter it's more likely to be apples, oranges, banana stuff that's readily available, but, but mixed fruit, whole grains, nuts, and sometimes a non-dairy milk, but usually not even. Uh, the cinnamon I add both because I like the flavor, but also because cinnamon has specific glucose stabilizing properties. It's, it's actually somewhat insulin sparing. I, I have no issues with, with insulin or glucose metabolism, but what the heck. Uh, you know, again, it, it, it's good for all of us. Uh, and I like how it tastes. Um, I sometimes will, and I eat, I eat a very late breakfast. And, and, and that's the other thing, by the way. You didn't ask me this, Mark, but I, I would say the one thing that, that belongs on no one's menu is dogma. There are fundamentals about eating well, just like there are fundamentals about the importance of physical activity. But imagine if I told you the only way for you to exercise, Mark, the only way is biking. It's all about biking. Biking is the best. Don't even think about hiking or swimming or anything else you might like to do, right? It's, it's the one thing. The one thing. It's the one thing. It's yeah. the one thing, I mean, it's just, right? Right. Silly. You know, maybe it's the one thing I love best. But there's no evidence, not a shred right. that, you know, biking is better right. than hiking is better than swim. Whatever you right. like to do. I mean, motion we know is good. And then the best way to be in motion is the way that you like to be in motion. So, you know, with diet, we actually devolve into just that sort of nonsense and tell one another, you know, you've got to eat exactly this way. So I would say, you know, one thing everybody should oppose is dogma on the menu. 
there's been a lot of dogma over the years about breakfast. You have to eat first thing in the morning. And I was like, you know, I'm not hungry first thing in the morning. I'm really <laughs> not. I have plenty of energy. I'm absolutely not hungry. I don't feel like eating. I can force myself to eat. I've experimented over the years with that where I've forced myself to eat breakfast early. And then I'm hungry at all sorts of times of day. I'm not ordinarily hungry. And, you know, it, frankly, it just doesn't work well for me. So I wait till I get hungry. I, I usually work out in the morning before I have breakfast. I have no deficit in my energy. I, I'm not recommending this either, by the way. I'm not being dogmatic right, about right. I, I'm being anti-dogmatic. In other words, <laughs> right. you know, within the basic right. parameters of you know, feeding homo sapiens well, do what works for you. So I, I don't get hungry usually till around noon. So that's when I have my breakfast. Um, you know, I get plenty of work done in the morning, get a workout in the morning, uh, have coffee, and then come you know, 11.30, noon-ish, I'm hungry, breakfast time. And then since I eat my breakfast so late, you know, I guess basically it's lunchtime for many people. Um, I don't need lunch. And sometimes I get hungry between my late breakfast and dinner, but usually not. If I do, fresh fruit, dried fruit, fresh veggies, nuts, um, almonds, walnuts, you know, something to snack on, but usually not more than that. Dinner is, is vegan more often than not. I love beans. I love lentils. I love, I've pretty much never met a vegetable I don't like, whole grains. Um, whether it's cooking grains, uh, bulgur wheat, uh, quinoa, or whole grain breads. Um, I will, usually with other people, uh, occasionally allow fish and seafood uh, in my diet, a little bit of dairy. I don't eat meat. I eat poultry, actually. I, I used to eat poultry, but uh, because of environmental concerns, ethical concerns, I, I've pretty much given it up. Uh, I eat it once a year now on Thanksgiving. My mom makes a turkey. She would disown me if I didn't eat her turkey. <laughs> Once a year, I thank the turkey for its great sacrifice. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not religiously vegan in, in the sense that you know, I, I must absolutely adhere every day. But um, there are three reasons why I'm vegan most of the time now. Uh, one is the best diets for human health are plant predominant, whole food mm -hmm. plant predominant. Uh, so all of us should be eating plenty of, of plant foods. And then the other two reasons will take you the rest of the way there. One is I love our fellow critters on this planet. You know, I think we should treat them well. And um, it, it just never sat well with me that, you know, I have dogs who are my best friends in the world and I have a horse who's one of my best friends in the world and, you know, animals of comparable intelligence are dinner. You know, a pig is, is as sensitive and intelligent as the family dog. And, and in factory farms, we don't just raise them and kill them. We, we torture them and abuse them. So, you know, it's quite horrible. So I, I renounced eating mammals many, many years ago, mostly because of the ethics. And then the third issue, and we all have to care about this, is the environmental impact of our diets. The simple fact is with 8 billion hungry homo sapiens in the world, how we eat is one of the single greatest influences on the overall health of the planet. Implications for climate change, aquifers, the melting of glaciers, the rising of seas, the raising of rainforests, the squandering of this planet's greatest treasure, biodiversity. It's always amazed me, Mark, how fascinated human beings are with the prospect of life on other planets while we're destroying life on this one. I mean, what, what an extraordinary treasure biodiversity is. And we, we are literally trashing it. You know, I mean, we are directly responsible for mass extinction. And as individuals, our ability to change that is limited. We all have to be part of bigger systems that change that. But one of the things we can do as individuals is eat in a way that is respectful of the rest of this beautiful world and, and the life in it. So, you know, I would argue that um, the reasons for eating the way I do are, you know, not, it's not that there's any dogma here about, you know, the one best way to eat. But I look at diet through those three lenses what's good for me, what's kinder and gentler to fellow creatures, and, and what's good for the planet. So uh, my breakfast, berries, uh, whole grain cereal, sometimes um, nuts, and uh, then I may snack between that and dinner. Dinner is usually vegan, um, so lots of diverse issues made with um, beans and lentils, occasional fish and seafood. My wife is French, so her cooking does use a little bit of dairy. Um, more often than not, sheep and goat rather than um, bovine, but a little bit of dairy there, and um, lots of salads, uh, lots of cooked veggies, um, 
I do like good wine. Uh, I do like good coffee. I do like good dark chocolate. You know, nobody should think that I'm a monk. I, I really like good food. And and by the way, I, I'll I'll finish my answer about how I typically eat. My wife has a beautiful free recipe site with cool. all of the cat, all the cat's family greatest hits. So people don't need to hear me give this <laughs> right description of my diet. You want to know all the different dishes and and what you'll see. So the website is quizinicity.com, like Cuisine City, but with an I in the okay. quizinicity.com. So Cat's Family Greatest Hits, help yourselves. And, and what you'll see is a big shift over the years toward more and more vegan. And that's because, you know, it's not that there's so much more evidence about a, a vegan diet being better for health than, say, a flexitarian diet or a Mediterranean diet. But the simple fact that I, I feel, and, and this has been hard for my wife. Again, she's French. She grew up in southern France. And so... Uh, she's a brilliant cook, but really likes to preserve the traditions of the diet she grew up with. And not cooking poultry, for example, was hard for her. But I said, look, you know, it, it's not your fault and it's not my fault that we live in the world now. If we had lived in the world 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you know, the environmental impact of our diets would have been much less of an issue. But there are 8 billion of us on the planet now. We have to think about that and we have to we have to walk the walk. We just have to. So our diets have, have absolutely shifted over the years because I'm concerned about issues outside the, the bounds of my own skin. And so I was, I think I was reading also in one of your books that you changed your email signature talking about the environmental impacts. And, and this is, seems to be a theme that you're, you're talking about. What is it in particular? Are there certain like is there something you heard or there a specific like set of like, oh, these one, two or three things that completely changed or shifted my perspective? Yeah, there, there are a few. First of all, I have a lifelong friend uh, who is now a professor of wildlife conservation at Cornell. He was uh, so we were in high school together. We, we've mm -hmm. been like brothers forever. And, uh, and he, he always uh, teased me that I, you know, I was busy advancing the health of the species that was busy destroying the planet. <laughs> and and he basically saying, are, are you sure you're on the right team? And I said, I think I am. But you know, I, I started to wonder as, as the environmental crisis became more and more acute. But he was always you know, sort of an external conscience saying, you really need to be paying attention to what humans are doing to the planet too. And I always respected that and I always cared about that. But he's been an influence. And again, he's had a brilliant career. Uh, he was the chief wildlife veterinarian in Botswana for a number of years, has done all sorts of interesting field work, and now runs basically conservation programming out of the Cornell Veterinary School. Another big influence on me was John Robbins' book, The Food Revolution. Uh, so th there, there are many different books or documentaries that can expose you to the horrendous abuses of factory farming. Right. But John's was the book that exposed me to it. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you just can't unsee it. I and mean, once you hear these stories and, and understand how horrible it is, you, mm -hmm. you can't say, well, I'm going to eat that anyway and pretend like I never heard that. I mean, you just, you just, you know, a person of conscience just can't do that. So John's book sort of changed my life. And then over recent years, you'd have to be living under a rock left behind by a melting glacier not to be aware of, you know, the, the massive impact we're we're burning down the Amazon rainforest. We, we could blame the crazy president of Brazil for that, but we really ought to blame ourselves. It's the global appetite for meat that makes beef so profitable. We're willing to destroy one of this planet's greatest natural treasures to raise more beef cattle to sell to satisfy the world's appetite. So let's blame not just the supply, which is Brazil. Let's blame the demand, which is us. So we're, we're burning down the Amazon. That's horrendous. Uh, we're melting the Arctic. That's horrendous. Um, I, I've actually used polar bears in my clinical counseling uh, for many, many years a, as a metaphor. I, 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 when I was trying to help patients understand why it's so hard not to succumb to obesity, I, I used to say, going back almost 30 years, imagine a polar bear in the Sahara Desert. How would it do? What would do badly? Is that the polar bear's fault? Well, no, it's just that, you know, it's not designed to thrive in that environment. Well, aha, your problem too. You're not designed to thrive in a world of glow-in-the-dark frankenfood and, you know, limitless supply of labor-saving technology. You are designed to be an animal in a natural world that has to use your muscles to get real food. 
Right. And if you were in that world, you'd be fine. And in this world, it's really hard to be fine. And you are a polar bear in the Sahara. Sadly, uh, all polar bears are going to be in the Sahara or something like it. They're certainly not going to be in their native home as we melt the Arctic ice. So we've got rainforest burning down. We've got the Arctic ice melting. We've got seas rising. You know, climate change is not just a vague concept anymore. It's affecting all of us directly. We're all seeing different weather than we're used to wherever we live. So at this point, to not be a citizen engaged in every possible effort to safeguard this planet, I think is just missing the big picture of our time. I have children. I have grown children, and, and you know someday they may have children, and they're all going to need a planet. So there have been a number of discrete influences on me, and many scientists have influenced me. Um, you know, I've watched everything that David Attenborough has ever produced. I've read everything that Richard Dawkins has ever written. I could go on and on. Right. But you know, at this point, the, the volumes of influence and evidence that speak to the urgency of planetary protection are really quite overwhelming. Okay, and let's talk about like how to how do you how do you translate your kind of recommendations, right? Like eat eat. Uh, you, uh, f- eat food, eat real food, mostly plants, right? Like yeah. uh, some mycopolins, right? Like how yeah. do you translate that into a modern world, right? For a modern guy, let's say, I mean, listen, you've got five, right? You have five kids. I do. Right. You've yeah. got an unbelievable number of commitments. You're super busy. You've got a lot of things going on. And so a lot of guys, I, you know, we, I speak to you all the time. They're like, Hey, listen, I've just, I have no time. Things are chaotic. Ki- you know, everything's going like how, what do you recommend for someone like that? To implement so, your advice. Yeah, yeah. So to be clear, I don't, when it comes to the, so the what is really very simple. It, right. You know, it, it's, it hides in plain sight. It's not rocket science. We right. know the what, the evidence is clear. The, the True Health Initiative, and I do encourage people to check that out, truehealthinitiative.org. You'll cool. see we've got, you know, 500 world leading experts from 45 countries, paleo right. to vegan, all saying we agree about the fundamentals right. of a healthful, sustainable diet. It's, it's, Again, th- th- this is quite obvious. So that's the what. How is a different question, and and how is highly personalized, right? So depending, what is your day like? Do you and of course during the pandemic, we're all working from home. But before the pandemic and after the pandemic, some people work from home, some people travel a lot. You know how you work, healthy living, healthy eating, healthy physical activity, sleep, stress management, all all the crucial stuff into your daily routine derives from the specifics of your daily routine. And, and one, thing's, one thing I always told my patients uh, over the 30 years of patient care that I did was, you're the boss. You tell me about you, and it's my job to empower you with information that fits within the context of what you tell me matters. So, you know, if you tell, I travel all the time. How do I eat well traveling? That's a very different set of answers than I work from home. How do I eat well? But there are generics, too, that fit everybody. One of which is decide that this matters. Decide that eating well actually matters. It's just one of those things that's not negotiable. You have to figure out how to do it. Because if if it's negotiable and there's some effort involved in figuring out how to do it, maybe you'll just never try. And you're not going to succeed if you don't try. So one is make it a priority. And that's entirely up to you. You you know, we can talk about the reasons why it should be a priority, but it's up to you to buy them or not buy them. And if you buy them, okay, that's step one. Step two Everything work, worthwhile takes a little bit of effort, except there's going to be some effort in transitioning from doing things however you do them now to a better way, because you, you have to learn new stuff to do something in a new way. Three, related to learning new stuff is do not just rely on willpower, develop skill power. Ask yourself, what are the skills I need and don't have to master my own health and vitality, to master the quality of my diet? Is it, you know, is it shopping? I don't, I don't know how to read labels. I don't know what to buy. Is it cooking? I don't have time to cook. I don't have interest in cooking or I don't know how to cook. Is it, you know, I don't know what to pick when I'm eating out and I eat out all the time. Is it, I don't know how to manage my appetite. What, what skills are you missing? Skill power is really important. I mean, I, I, I like to use the example of a pilot because we, I think, all respect that skill. It's so obvious. Somebody gets in the cockpit of a big plane and they can make the damn thing fly. I mean, it's just kind of, it's kind of, <laughs> but you know, pilots are not special people necessarily. Some pilots are cranky and some are friendly and, you know, some are articulate and some are not. I mean, they're just like the rest of us in terms of their human attributes, but they have a skill set 
those of us who can't fly planes just don't have. Now, if you want to be a pilot, you can't just wish upon a star. You have to actually take lessons and learn how to fly. But you could. You could acquire those skills. So eating well is a lot easier than flying a plane, but it's skill dependent. Knowing how to read a label, knowing in every aisle of the supermarket what's the better choice to make. How do I consistently buy stuff I actually want to eat and yet trade up the nutritional quality? More fiber, more potassium, more healthy fats, less sugar, less salt, less unhealthy fats. What do I look for? How do I do that? And then when I get it home, what do I do with it? And so, again, there's, there's a skill set. And as you said, I've done uh, 18 or 19 books to date, and this is what many of them are about. All the details of both. Here's the what, right. and, and here's the how. So, I, you know, I, I, I've addressed this at great length in, in many of the works I've done, and I'm constantly looking for new ways to do it. So at this stage of my career, I'm an entrepreneur. I founded a company I'm running called Diet ID, and we're working to help people accomplish all of this via a digital platform. People can learn more at dietid.com. And of course, excuse me, there are many other apps and, and you know, sort of digitized mm -hmm. offerings to help you. But decide what skills do you need to eat? Well, is it knowledge? Do you, do you lack good information? I don't know what a healthy diet is in the first place. Well, then you need to learn. But maybe it's not that. No, I know exactly what a healthy diet is. I just don't like what it tastes like. Okay, well, then I would recommend Taste Bud Rehab to you. Taste Bud Rehab is the fact that taste buds are adaptable little fellas. When they can't be with the foods they're used to loving, they learn to love the foods they're with. So I would say if you think you like the taste of junk food and don't like the taste of wholesome food, it's because you're used to junk food. So you want to develop a plan to transition food by food away from highly processed junk and toward more wholesome food. And you will find you will incrementally start to prefer more and more wholesome food. Totally achievable. So again, you need you need to decide either on your own or with the help of a health professional, coach, mm -hmm. physician, dietitian, somebody that, that can guide you. What what is my skill deficit? So make it a priority. Commit to some effort. Identify missing skills and acquire the the relevant skill power. And then finally, preparation. You know, let, let's say the main problem is you know, I'm, I'm a busy guy and I you know I've got I want to eat well, but uh, you know, I, I don't want to carve out a big chunk of every day. Right. Okay. Then you know, is there a day, uh, maybe on the weekend, you know, one dedicated chunk of time where if you shop very efficiently and have all the rough, right stuff in your pantry, in your fridge, it's going to make a massive difference to the quality of your diet throughout the week. And, and let's face it, you know, there there are more and more ways to conveniently stock up on really nutritious stuff, right? So you know, you can find. And, and and this is assuming that money is not a huge impediment. If you tell me I don't have time, I don't have money, I don't have not, you know, there there are. Right. I live in a food desert. I mean, right. There's right. a point at which I say, okay, you know what? <laughs> you need remedial help. You really do. It's not your fault, but you know, maybe you you don't have, you can't afford healthy food. You don't have access to healthy food. You don't have time. You don't have knowledge. This is all fixable. Some of it you can fix with education, but some of it you can't. Some of it requires societal fixes, right? I mean, we, you know, we have to make nutritious food accessible to you, we have to make mm -hmm. it affordable to you. Okay, so let, let's be honest about public health. There are haves and have-nots, and fixing these issues for the have-nots, is it, it's a societal problem. It's bigger than you and me. And it's, it's one of the things I've worked on throughout my career, but let's acknowledge it. Let's assume that the people listening in here, because to be quite honest, I think you know people who have the most barriers to eating well are not routinely listening to podcasts about nutrition. Let's, let's fair, fair enough. Right? right? So the people who are listening to podcasts about nutrition are already a privileged group, and you probably can afford to get bean salads as opposed to just beans in a can, right? That, that kind of thing. So there are all kinds of opportunities you know, at, at any good supermarket or your friendly neighborhood health food store to actually get what are, in essence, either whole meals or components of meals that are really high quality and put together for you, and you just need to have them in your house. And then you get hungry, and you know you eat them as they are. You pop them in the microwave, and you've got a really wholesome, and and by the way, relatively low cost meal. And I say low cost because if you're emphasizing plants, you're saving a ton of money. Beans, lentils, cooking grains, incredibly nutritious, and really, really inexpensive compared to any kind of meat. So if you shift to more plants, less meat, you're saving money. If you shift to more water, less soda, you're saving money. Right. Eating better 
is not always more expensive. At times, it really can be extremely economical. And so the money you're saving can go partly toward the convenience of, let me get these prepackaged meals so I have less prep work to do. I'll stop because that's enough to, to simply paint the general picture, Mark, that if you have the will, you absolutely can devise a way. It is within reach, right? You, but, you know, you, don't, you can't just snap your fingers and say, I want to eat better. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to learn anything. I don't want to make any effort. Uh, I just expect it to happen to me passively. Well, nothing in life works like that. Your education doesn't work that way. Your job doesn't work that way. Raising children doesn't work that way. Learning how to drive doesn't work that, day, that way. Learning how to ride a bike, learning how to do any sport, mm -hmm. succeeding, at, you know, any performance, um, doing well with athletic activity. Everything worthwhile requires time and effort. Why should something that really is the bedrock of lifelong vitality deserve any less? So it's not a huge lift. But yeah, there's some. You know, you got to do some lifting if you want to go from typical American diet to a high quality diet that will run your better health for the rest of your life. Dr. Katz, I really appreciate that. And so I, I I'm curious to hear. You know where? Well, I, I personally know, but can you can you uh, let everyone know like where where they can learn more about you or they can follow you? Sure. Well, first of all, Mark, thanks so much for having right. me. Pleasure to have this discussion. And, and again, I appreciate the, the kind words. Uh, so my website, which is kind of a portal to everything I do and, and have done over the years, is davidkatzmd.com. So if you just want easy, one-stop <laughs> shopping, uh, there are links there to the True Health Initiative, links there to my company, Diet ID. Uh, links to my wife's beautiful recipe site, quizinicity.com, and links to my writing and videos and public speaking and, and on and on it goes. So davidkatzmd.com. If you want to cut out the middleman, however, recipes, quizinicity.com. Right. The global expert consensus about lifestyle as medicine, truehealthinitiative.org. Mm -hmm. And more about my private sector efforts to make diet, the vital sign I believe it deserves to be, dietid.com. And then, of course, um, you know, you mentioned my book. So the, the most recent book uh, co-authored with Mark Bittman is How to Eat. Right. <laughs> it's a pretty blunt title. Uh, the, the publisher came up with that. Mark and I had far more creative titles. <laughs> I, I guess that works. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, Mark, uh, New York Times columnist for many years and, and the iconic author of How to Cook Everything. So we were sort of joking, okay, it's how to eat, but, you know, in parentheses, but not everything. <laughs> uh, but it's, a, you know, it's a really fun book. It, it's comprehensive, but it's easily accessible. It's conversational. It, it's quite unique in the way it's put together, but it really does cover pretty much everything. So uh, it's not a bad place to start. Uh, makes a nice holiday gift. So uh, check out How to Eat. Awesome. And so by the way, I'm going to have this full transcript on the building site. We're going to have links, like everything we've talked about, we're going to have links. So it's really easy for everyone to uh, find. Right. And yeah, like I personally think like I mean, how to eat, and especially, especially like truth, truth, uh, truth about eating. Um, I mean, truth, it's, truth about, sorry, truth sorry, about foods. sorry, sorry, truth about foods. I, I truth have, about foods. I, I've got a lot of. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, so that was that was the book before how to eat, right, and, and right that before. really that one's my magnum opus. But just to right. warn people, you know that that's a seven hundred and fifty page tome. I mean, that that's a doorstop. And but but I will say quickly about the truth about food. Um, Everything I know about diet and health is in that book, and that all proceeds from that book go to support the True Health Initiative. So it's a worthy cause, another great holiday gift. So right. uh, yeah, <laughs> and I was going to say, so I personally have it on a Kindle version, so I can search it, and what's, right. and that's what's really really powerful and cool, and that's why I want to bring it up. Is like it can, it's like the evidence based Bible to healthy eating. Thank you. That's what and, it is. And actually, yeah, I mean, initially, I really just wanted to do a Kindle version for a number of reasons. First, it's a huge book, and that way right. you could just look up whatever topic or question you wanted to address. Second, you know, we spare the, the, the trees and not generate the paper. A lot of people want an actual book in their hand, so it's available both ways. But I totally agree with you. Yeah, the best way to get the truth about food would be electronically. Cool. So, again, uh, how to eat truth about food. I mean, obviously, he's had, you know, 18 books. But I, I think either of those two books, especially, you know, are incredible. Again, I, I seriously do think the the truth about food. It's like a uh, it's like the evidence based healthy eating bible. So um, I, I really really appreciate uh, you being here, uh, Dr. Katz, and uh, and I, I wish you the best. Same to you, Mark. Very good to be with you. Stay well. Happy holidays, and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Cool. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye now. <laughs>